So welcome back to the third part of the getting into downwinding series. In the first two parts we talked about getting your basic gear ready and getting you up and going and paddling on rivers and estuaries and hopefully by now you've had a couple goes or you've got a good understanding of where you can go in your local area to get some really fun safe first time downwinding under your belt. This video we're going to be trying to raise the bar, we're going to get you thinking outside of those rivers and estuaries and getting you to paddle in the more open sea states but making sure you're doing it as safe as possible. I'm gonna talk you through the things you need to consider to take it up a gear to get you paddling in those open sea states and bigger swells. Now the first point we're gonna talk about is your paddling location. Just like when we looked at our river and estuary paddles, you've gotta look at your local area and get your forecast up in front of you and find out what spots will work in certain wind directions. Ideally, directly downwind is where you're gonna be going from point A to point B. Around the world, there is so many different paddling options to go downwind. Maybe you're paddling across a bay, maybe you're paddling along a coastline, maybe even you're doing an island hop from island to island. The first thing you notice when you go out on the open water is that the sea state, the water state, is very different from the river or an estuary. Rivers and estuaries are very predictable when it comes to going downwind and riding small bumps that the winds produced. Because out in the sea you might have a swell that's thousands of miles away that might be coming in one direction and maybe there's a small chop that's being produced by the wind on your back. All of that put together does make a different riding feel opposed to what you felt on the rivers and estuaries. So if keeping that in mind, if you imagine three different locations, let's say along the coast, across a bay, or an island hop, they're all gonna produce different sort of sea states. They're gonna be different to paddle in. Along the coast, you're gonna find it very safe. You're close to the coast. You're always gonna be able to get an exit point, but the swell might be very confused because of the backwash off of the coast very close to you. Traveling across an open bay is a little bit more dangerous because you're more exposed to open water, but the swell pattern is going to be better and you're going to get a better riding experience. By far the best experience for downwinding is to be going from island to island because you have very little interference from other swells and you have a real direct route of travel. But then if you go to a small island you can't get back from, then it doesn't really work at all. So you found a few spots in your local area that look good for downwinding. Then you need to take a note of what direction they work best in to give you the best direct line downwind. You need to work out how you're gonna exit, where you're gonna get off and get your car logistics if you need to do that at the end of the paddle and also maybe have some exits halfway through the paddle if something happens you need to get off the paddle earlier than your original exit point. The next really important thing is getting your weather forecast and understanding your weather forecast really well before you go on the water. You have the weather forecast in front of you, you need to work out what local paddle for you would be best and also look at the weather either side of that paddle. If it's blowing the same direction of wind for three days, you're pretty much guaranteed it's gonna be the same wind direction. But if there's only a slight wind direction for full of three hours and it switches to a completely different wind direction, then maybe open water paddling isn't the best option. Maybe look towards your local rivers and estuaries for that downwind session instead. Now obviously the windier it is and the more exposed and open the paddle location you choose, the bigger the swell is going to be. So high winds, especially over a long period of time, will produce bigger waves and that's just got to be a good thing for downwinding, hasn't it? But actually it's not always the case. A lot of people don't realise that big swells, especially ground swells that have been made up from thousands of miles away in the ocean, are moving really, really quickly. 15, 20, 25 miles an hour, these big swells are moving. So if you go paddling where the swell is really big, you're gonna be left to try and catch that faster swell, and if you don't catch it, it's gonna be a very awkward and uncomfortable place to paddle. So I always think windy days are great, but the real good downwinding days are the days where the wind has suddenly picked up from nothing the day before. So the sea state's relatively calm and the wind's picked up and produced a good size swell and chop. If it's been blowing for five or six days and the swell is 15 feet, but still the same amount of wind, it's gonna be a lot harder to downwind paddle. And a lot of people don't realize that, especially as you're getting into the more open water paddling. So moving away from the forecast, there's one other thing you need to check and it changes 
all over the world and that is the tide. If you live in a big tidal area like we do, we have tidal rises of six meters, which can make a huge difference to how the waves move and how you are moving on the direction that you want to be paddling in. If the tide is going out and you're paddling across a bay with the tide going out, you can be guaranteed that you're going to move sideways with the tide as well. So you're going to have to try and understand and think about tide as well, which is why that river and estuary paddle we did was great. The tide was going out, the wind was going out. We were going in one direction. You get into the open sea, you've got to think about tide, location and weather forecast and make sure they all work together, which is why it's a little bit harder to make sure they're all working perfectly to get the best paddling experience. So obviously you've got all your safety gear in place. You've got your personal flotation device, you've got your VHF radio, or you've got your mobile phone, you've got your dry bag, maybe you've got a small first aid kit. You've got all of that in place because you've been paddling with it on the rivers and estuaries. An absolute must to do, especially if you're paddling in more open waters, is telling people where you're going, when you're gonna be coming back. And I mean telling more than one person, tell your, friend or family member that you're going to be paddling from here to here with this person but also it's really worth telling the coast guard the rnli the local authorities that you're going to be launching from this location and going to this location and i should be at that location in two hours i'll give you a call when i come in at three o'clock just by saying that then they have an understanding that somebody is paddling from here to here and when they do get a phone call if they get a phone call saying i think i saw a paddle border and he fell off twice they'll be like oh he's paddling on this location here where did you see him i saw him off here oh that's where they're meant to be so it just helps the authorities not get in a panic because the last thing you want to do is get a call out to you for the coast guard and actually you're completely fine by us phoning and telling the local authorities that we're going paddling does a number of good things. Obviously it keeps us safe because they're aware of where we're paddling, but really it starts to give them a good understanding about what stand-up paddleboard downwinding is. And actually when it is windy, people are going to start to go downwinding and it shows that we're safe and we've thought about the risks and we've told them that we're doing it. Now stand-up paddleboard downwinding is so much fun and it really is very, very simple. You're being blown downwind with your paddle and your board. Yeah, you've got all your safety stuff as well, but it's very simple to do from A to B. But there's always the what ifs, and there always will be the what ifs on every sport you do. If you think the waves are too big, if you're, too, if you're unsure about the paddle, don't do it. Just go and have a nice river estuary paddle instead. But like in any discipline of our stand-up paddle boarding, there's always the what ifs. What if I break something? What if the wind changes direction? Well. The key point to go out with all of this is don't leave your board, never leave your board, never take your leash off, always stay with your board, you've got way more flotation and you're way more visible too. If you've got your PFD, put that on, stay nice and visible, make a phone call, say to somebody, I'm in trouble. The only thing I've ever have happened to me is the reason I carry the duct tape. And a lot of people have been asking, what is the duct tape for? And for the reason I haven't told you yet, because I don't want to scare you guys off to thinking everything is going to be a disaster when you go stand up paddleboard downwinding, because it isn't. Because 99% of the time, nothing is going to happen. You're just going to cruise downwind and have the ride of your life. But the worst thing that could happen is if you break your paddle. And not if you break your paddle anywhere, it's if you break your paddle like this. Because if you break your paddle like this, you are basically stuffed. You can't use your paddle blade, the top section, because there's nothing on it. Because if it broke here, you could just paddle it a little bit smaller. If it broke here and you had a little stubby pole, you could use it as like a dragon boat paddle. If you break it like this, there is nothing you can do unless you have a roll of duct tape. Now, this is why the duct tape comes in because you can fix anything with duct tape. I take duct tape absolutely everywhere, surfing trips around the world. This stuff is the default stuff to take. If this happened again, and it didn't happen when I had this, because I would have fed fixed it, I could have just taped the paddle, put it further up the shaft and taped a load of duct tape around the paddle and the shaft. My paddle would have been a little bit shorter and I would have paddled home, no problem at all. But what happened when that happened? Well, it wasn't a disaster. I just had to lie down and paddle it like a surfboard. You'll find that down at paddle boards do move really quickly as a surfboard. You might find your shoulders start to ache after about 40 minutes, but if you go on your knees and paddle it like that, it's still very easy to paddle. So again, it's a risk, it's a what if, but at the end of the day, it's not really a disaster, is it? 
downwind stand-up paddleboarding is such a good sport and it's so simple there's always going to be the what is to think about because you are pushing that comfort zone but that's part of the fun you're getting out in the elements and exploring and enjoying a different side of our sport if you do it safely and you respect the ocean and you respect your, your abilities you will have a lot of fun and you will get a lot out of downwind paddling baby steps Start off small, little rivers, light winds, move into the bigger rivers, bigger winds, then to the coastal waters and locations and windy conditions. Always paddle with a buddy and always tell people where you're going and when you'll be back. It's great fun, give it a go and let us know any of your comments. Thank you very much.